This is a public health announcement brought to you by Heather Shepard. The Primal Pioneer. Live an outdoor life. This is the Primal Pioneer podcast, a show dedicated to helping you achieve optimal health by making radical lifestyle, dietary, and environmental shifts to support forward movement with your health. I'm your host, Heather Shepard, medical health practitioner, gut health specialist, and homeopathic doctor in training. When I was 23 years old, I suffered a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, and this shifted my life from being a super athletic type A kind of person to, well, being a slug. The side effects of my TBI left me sidelined from physical activity for nearly 12 years. I tried every modality under the sun, desperately yearning, trying, and hoping to get better. It wasn't until I stepped outside of the conventional medical model and even much of the alternative medical model that I saw real lasting progress with my health. Even after 12 years of struggling with the negative side effects of my TBI, poor digestion, brain fog, brain pain, anxiety, poor sleep, weight gain, and low energy, today, I feel better than I did in my 20s. And I achieved my version of optimal health by deep diving into the areas of the body, particularly the mitochondria and emotional energetics that most notably affect and impact our health. Sadly, however, these are the areas of health that most healthcare practitioners overlook and underconsider today. Today, I help thousands of people overcome both acute and chronic ailments using my nature and science-based radical approach to health. During this episode of the Primal Pioneer podcast, I deep dive into a question submitted by a listener all about how to approach breast cancer, specifically hormone-positive breast cancer, using an effective, proactive approach. I deep dive into some of her lab values to see what might be influencing their low and altered values. I talk a lot about hormone health, cholesterol, sunlight, how to reset your metabolism, the importance of sulfation, cautions regarding a vegan and vegetarian diet, especially when it comes to improving hormone and metabolic health. I talk about root causes of inflammation and the importance of healing the emotions. Now, let's dive into this episode so you can start to learn more about how to improve your hormone and metabolic health and even approach cancer in new, empowering ways. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. I'm super stoked to dive into this episode because it's inspired by a question from a listener. And um, I'm really excited to share this question with you because I feel as though it pertains to a lot of people, uh, especially women out there, anyone with breast cancer, anyone with hormone positive breast cancer, anyone out there um, looking to rebuild their hormones. Um, Maybe you're suffering from a hormonal disorder, whether it's cancer related uh, or otherwise. These questions um, that the listener asked in and sent in for the show today, uh, I sense will be very revealing to um, your struggles. Maybe you have a similar experience. And so we're going to dive right in here today because um, I have a, a pretty in-depth answer. Usually when, when somebody asks about diet, hey, Heather, what's the best diet for a hormone positive you know, breast cancer, or what's the best diet for this condition or that condition? Usually it's, um, the the answer to that is pretty extensive. There's a lot of different bases to cover. There's a lot of things to consider. And um, so it's not usually this black and white cut and dry type of, oh, hey, just do keto and you'll be good to go. Um, You know, that we tend to seek That's the information that um, is presented to us in the mainstream. However, it's just not usually that, you know, easy um, or straightforward. Healing is super um, multifactorial. There's a lot of layers to cover. There's, um, There's a lot going on on the emotional level, on the mental level, on the physical level, and all of these areas need to be addressed. 
So um, let's dive right into the question here because um, I have a pretty uh, big answer that, that will go through most of those three layers, the mental, emotional, and physical here um, to help the listener and to help anyone out there struggling with their hormone health, uh, breast cancer, especially a hormone positive breast cancer. So here's the question and the, the, um, the uh, individual submitted the question would like to remain anonymous. So we'll honor that. And here we go. Here's the question. Hi, Heather. I have a question about therapeutic keto and active cancer, uh, breast cancer, hormone positive. Um, for a long time, I did not want to try keto because um, I did not want to incorporate animal products into my diet. I just thought there was too much conflicting um, science around uh, that they might promote cancer growth. And so after my diagnosis, the last few years, I've been eating um, vegan, raw vegan for a while, then with some cooked foods. Um, you know, for a little bit, I was eating some eggs and a, a little bit of a piece of fish. And then I switched into the one thing that I hadn't tried because um, it didn't seem to be shifting anything for me in a positive way. It was just kind of staying the same. So I switched to therapeutic keto recently. Um, and of course, I'm doing all these other therapies alongside of, of this um, that are just holistic detox, um, IVs and um, supplements and things like that, and meditation and spiritual work and emotional work and all that. But my question specifically about diet, because um, when I switched to therapeutic keto, which is um, Dr. Nasha's uh, plan, uh, the metabolic approach to cancer and under 20 grams of total carbs per day, so very low carb and, um, and also pretty low protein too. Uh, but I started eating meat for the first time since I was a kid. And I'm thinking, okay, my low protein and low albumin and low white blood cell count, those are definitely going to go up from eating meat because that's something that had been, you know, a little concerning on my, my past labs, how low those numbers were. Um, strangely enough, after, you know, really doing a really good job with this therapeutic keto where I was in ketosis every day, pretty much, um, pretty deep, um, above three. And when I was fasting and doing extended fasting, going up to over six sometimes, and um, so I get my labs back after two and a half months of this therapeutic keto diet and everything just seems to have gone in the wrong direction. Um, so protein, albumin, white blood cell count are even lower than before. Um, certain things that I never had problems with are higher, like triglycerides, my sed rate, my copper, my platelets. They're now in kind of like a danger zone when I'd never had issues with them before. Um, my cholesterol, my good went down and my bad went way up. And I'm not super concerned about cholesterol like I'm about everything else because I know there's some kind of misconceptions with cholesterol, which you've talked about. But, um, you know, it's just one more piece of the puzzle. And I thought things don't seem to be, um, you know, moving the way they should be. Um, also, of course, my tumor markers um, more than doubled. And this was a big difference from things that have happened in the past. So at this point, I'm very confused because I was doing, I thought a very clean version of this diet, no dairy, because that couldn't really affect uh, growth hormones for uh, breast cancer and um, grass fed meats and greens from my garden. And um, I'm not really even sure what I should be eating anymore. It's, um, I don't really know if this is a good sign that, hey, this diet does not work for you and your type of cancer. Maybe, um, my cancer's, uh, you know, feeding off the glutamate pathway and all the animal protein was actually not helpful. Um, or maybe it's just like, this is an adjustment period. Um, and I need to do some tweaking. Um, certainly it makes me nervous. And so, um, I don't want to keep going down a path that is not going to serve me. And, uh, I would love some feedback on, um, what I'm doing here. <laughs> if you could help advise about getting labs back after keto that just really don't seem like they're going in the right direction. Thanks so much. Okay. So 
let's dive right in here. There's a bunch of different points that I want to cover with regard to this question. It's an awesome question. And again, you can see even this individual's question is multi-layered. There, there's many layers here to address. There's a lot going on with diet, with um, diet. I don't want to say failures because we're never failing. We're, when something doesn't work out, it's simply just giving us more information, right? So um, the diet isn't quite going the way uh, she had anticipated or hoped for, or that was presented in the ketogenic world. Um, and her hormones are struggling and her, her lab results um, are not going in the direction that she would like or anticipated, especially after really committing hardcore to the ketogenic diet, which in the cancer world and in, in the weight loss world, um, a ketogenic diet is really promoted as very helpful for these conditions. And it can be, but I tend to use a, a more modified uh, ketogenic diet. Um, but usually people who go hardcore on the keto diet, especially women, um, it tends not to go as smoothly as um, it does for males. But anyway, let's dive into the question here because there's a lot of layers. So first and foremost, we um, want to just dismiss this blind belief that hormone positive cancers, you know, shouldn't include meat or animal products in the diet because they're going to alter the hormones even more. They're going to disturb hormone signaling even more. And this is super inaccurate. Now, if you have a hormone related cancer, you know, you can have it for a different reason than, you know, uh, a million other individuals with the same cancer. So right off the bat, we don't, we want to take you out of the box. Like, okay, if you have a hormone positive cancer, then you should avoid animal products. That's a very black and white approach. It doesn't go very deep into the reasons as to why you may specifically be struggling uh, or bumping up against hormonal imbalances or a hormone positive cancer. Okay. So the notion that animal products um, feed these type of cancers is highly inaccurate. Now we could kind of argue with that a little bit if you're eating really poor quality animal products, you know, if you're eating feedlot uh, meat, if you're eating McDonald's, if you're eating chicken nuggets, if you're eating fried, you know, uh, chicken, fried fish, anything, you know, fried, um, or just really poor quality meat, really poor quality fats, um, then yes, in these cases, it can influence the hormones in a destructive way. So um, this is a big reason why I am so uh, such a proponent of grass-fed animal fats and really healthy fats in the diet, because if you get the wrong fats in there, the pro-inflammatory fats, which we'll talk about a little bit more in this you know, throughout this this episode to answer the question here. But if you have the wrong kind of fats in your diet, that can actually um, diminish hormone health. So we want to keep that in mind. But in general, if you're eating very healthy fats, we're talking about grass-fed butter, we're talking about pasture-raised lard, pasture-raised leaf lard. I really like those for their vitamin D content. Um, if you're eating grass-fed ghee, if you have a really good quality coconut oil in the diet, and if you're, you know, using a small amount of olive oil, okay, we want first cold pressed extra virgin olive oil, and I never heat that up. I don't recommend heating that up, um, and I only use that for a condiment once in a while. I don't even use it on a daily basis. Sometimes not even on a weekly basis. Um, so those fats are designed, especially uh, the animal fats, the grass-fed animal fats, to actually support hormone health, to support cellular health, and they're really important aspects to have in the diet, uh, despite what you are struggling with. But especially if we have a hormonal imbalance, we want to rebuild the hormones, right? And you need cholesterol in the diet in order to help rebuild your hormones. You cannot make steroid hormones um, without the presence of cholesterol. 
So this is really important. So that's just, you know, one blind belief we want to dissolve right off the bat because I know a lot of mainstream information out there is like anything hormone positive, any hormone imbalance, avoid animal products. And that's just super black and white. And um, it's really not getting to the heart of the issue. Uh, animal products uh, in when they're from healthy forms are actually going to be an important part of rebuilding the hormones. So um, I also just want to note here that what I'm going to describe as I'm answering the different layers of this question here, this is not intended as medical advice. I'm not giving anybody medical advice here. It's simply um, if I had, if I was struggling with this issue, how I would approach the situation. And when I have private clients, this is also uh, how I would approach the situation. So. Um, the, this individual with the question also expressed that she had a previous history with, with a long-term vegan diet, right? And so from all of this stuff that she's read on the internet or from books or, or where she's collected her information, she's afraid to add in meat and animal products due to the conflicting science around this. You know, a lot of people say it's inflammatory. It causes estrogen levels to rise. Um, and it's dangerous for people with hormone positive cancers and, and hormonal imbalances. However, I, I want to mention here that one, that's a blind belief. And um, also, here's a question. Okay, if, and let's just say, if meat and animal products actually did cause or contribute to hormone positive cancers, then a vegan diet should really protect against this in the first place. And we know this individual was on a vegan diet and or vegetarian diet for, for much of their adult life. Even uh, at younger ages, they were on more of a plant-based diet. And this individual still uh, got a cancer diagnosis and a hormone positive cancer. So if it were really to make sense that animal products um, cause cancer, then we could hypothetically say that eating a vegan or vegetarian diet would prevent against this disease. And I'm bringing this point up, um, not just for the individual who asked the question, but I see many people over in um, the Keto Cancer Solution Facebook page that, that I manage who have been at least at some point in their life, and not all people, not all the individuals, but but many of them, have been on a, a long-term vegan and or vegetarian diet at some point in their life and they still came up against a cancer diagnosis. So that right there in itself is, is you know, proof in the pudding that um, a vegan or vegetarian, you know, plant-based diet does not actually prevent cancer in all cases, okay? Um, so I rarely ever prescribe a, a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet to people with a past history of veganism and or vegetarianism. I rarely, um, recommend that diet in any case. Um, however, some people might need like a short term vegetarian cleanse and I'm talking like, you know, a few days, um, not a few years or several years or, or even several months. So um, we, we really have to keep in mind that the individuals who have been long-term vegan, long-term vegetarian, they have uh, a couple things going on that are of uh, great importance to address when it comes to the healing process. Um, and number one is that the bulk of their foods didn't contain any cholesterol. It didn't contain vitamin A. It didn't contain vitamin D. There wasn't any vitamin K2 in there. These things are only found in animal products, um, and these are elements that are part of the diet that are needed to um, help with the synthesis and production of steroid hormones. So, um, you know, the estrogens, the testosterones, progesterones, etc., they all rely on cholesterol. You need cholesterol in order to um, have healthy hormones. So anybody with a past history of veganism or vegetarianism, we actually know that there's not enough hormones, there's not enough vitality 
in the body to make adequate amounts of hormones. And in many breast cancer cases that I see today, uh, it's not a result of uh, excess hormones, um, but it's simply a result of there's actually not enough hormones in balance. So one may be higher than another one and one may be super low, but honestly, um, if you get your Dutch hormone test and um, you, you could just Google that, do you T as in Tom C-H hormone test? Um, you can order that through your practitioner and that will show you um, that that's a pretty good test for gauging your your steroid hormone levels. It's a test that I highly recommend for anyone struggling with a hormone positive breast cancer or cancer in general or just struggling with hormone health. It'll give a, a really good uh, picture as to what your hormone levels are. Most people who have breast cancer who get that test done actually see that much of their steroid hormone levels are actually low. So the question needs to go to, you know, what causes a hormone positive breast cancer in the first place? That's a big question, but one answer is we need to actually rebuild the hormones because actually deficient hormone production, you're not actually producing enough hormones actually drives these types of cancers. So um, another thing we need to really consider, especially people who have been long-term vegan or vegetarians, and believe me, I know all about this because I was a vegetarian for seven years, um, you know, way back in my early, uh, my late teens and early twenties. And so I progressively saw my health get worse on these diets. Initially it was better. And I, since it was a lot better because I had removed a lot of foods that I was actually sensitive to uh, and allergic to, such as wheat and such as cow dairy and grains and this sort of thing. However, um, as I continued, continued on with the diet over time, uh, my hormone health really, really uh, suffered immensely. And I know a lot of people are hung up here and they're like, whoa, 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 Heather, like we're talking about cancer here. What about Chris beat cancer? What about this person beat cancer with a vegetarian or vegan diet? What about the Gerson diet? There are so many layers to go into here, but we have to first uh, remember that uh, one, if a male uh, does a vegan or vegetarian diet, they have much different hormonal needs than women do. So this is one major reason I typically don't see the same positive effects with women who do a vegan or vegetarian diet for cancer versus men. Um, and, you know, men often need meat in their diet as well and, and animal fats when they have cancer. But it's it tends to be, um, you know, have a less of an impact, a uh, negative impact when when males are doing a vegan or vegetarian diet just simply due to the different hormonal needs. Also, when we look, and this is just briefly because I want to give a little bit of, a, of context and background to some of these diets that are promoted in the cancer world um, that revolve around veganism, vegetarianism. And, and so let's talk about the Gerson diet just for a minute here because a lot of pe people have heard of Dr. Gerson and his work around um, a vegan or a so-called vegan or vegetarian diet to approach cancer. Um, what that diet today, uh, the way it's used, the way it's promoted, uh, the way people are, are engaging in it is, is much, much different than Dr. Gerson initially, you know, used the diet. When Dr. Gerson used this diet back in the early 1900s, okay, um, there was a lot of juicing, but the juicing was not done with any juicer. It was done with a very high quality juice press that preserved um, the potassium and sodium ratio within the vegetable structure that was being the cell membrane of the veg vegetable structure. And so this is very important because um, anything outside of the, the Norwalk juicer, I believe that's what it's called. Um, does not do this, does not preserve this potassium to sodium ratio. And if we look at the roots of cancer, the root causes, one of them from 
just this physiological nutritional standpoint is that your cells aren't producing enough water. And when your cells or your mitochondria aren't producing enough water, then your the charge in your cell literally diminishes. Okay, it's like that cell phone battery running out of juice. The battery's getting lower and lower and lower. So the less water you produce at the cellular level, the less charge in your cell. Okay, because the sodium and the potassium surrounding the cell is diminished simply because you're not producing enough water at the mitochondrial level. So the whole thing with juicing is that, or the initial uh, reason why Dr. Gerson engaged in this diet and promoted this diet and had great success with it is because he used um, the Nordic juicer, which is a press, okay, which preserved these, the, the, kept the potassium and sodium levels intact with in the juice, within the vegetable juice, the individual would drink that, okay, and then their um, their sodium to potassium levels uh, and charge within the cell would improve. Now, they were also doing a lot of other things, you know, the coffee enemas, which if you're doing coffee enemas and you're not replenishing your cells with minerals like Dr. Gerson did in these, you know, these vegetable juices, uh, pressed using the, the Norwalk juicer, then you're going to cause dehydration at the cellular level. Level You're going to further perpetuate this, almost this like water dehydration at the mitochondrial level. And that's a main thing that we need to address when it comes to overcoming cancer. The other thing is there was a lot of fresh pressed liver juice in the Gerson diet. Many reasons for that, so many enzymes, B vitamins, um, and this was a huge part of the original Gerson diet. There were many other factors, but those are some of the missing links. You know, people just think, oh, well, I'm going to just juice, and they go out and buy any juicer and start juicing any vegetables. Um, and we also have to remember that the climate, the atmosphere, the environment that Dr. Gerson did this diet was. Uh, in a very strong solar environment, okay? And uh, we didn't have this uh, exposure to EMFs that we do today. And we also weren't living as, as much indoor lifestyles as we are today, which you'll see as I continue to dive into the question here today is a huge part of the cancer healing process. Another thing I want to mention for vegetarians and vegans is that um, I would highly recommend you go back and visit uh, and, and listen to episode 25. It's the last episode where I talked a lot about carbohydrate metabolism and um, deuterium. For those of you who haven't heard about deuterium or, or, or don't know about it, um, this you can learn all about in the last episode. But it is uh, an element, an isotope of hydrogen that is found in some foods, it tends to be much higher in vegan and vegetarian diets because it's found a lot in fruits, it's found in grains. Any issue with lectins, lectins is a kind of a hot topic today. And really the core issue, if we boil it down, is that there's a lot of deuterium in those foods. So, you know, tune into episode 25 to learn more about that. But vegans and vegetarians have some of the highest inflammation levels simply because the deuterium levels in their diet and in their food is super high. And so um, while, you know, these foods are coming from nature, right? They're grown in the earth. Mother nature produced these foods. So, you know, what's the deal here? Why isn't, why can't the body handle them? The issue with deuterium becomes that um, people aren't simultaneously engaged in ways to deuterium deplete their mitochondria. And um, when you eat a vegetarian diet, and let's say you live in a, at a high latitude, or you don't go outside, or you're looking at blue light all day, this is going to drive deuterium levels up. And basically, in a nutshell, deuterium is like putting maple syrup in your engine, and it significantly depletes health. So um, whenever anybody presents uh, and comes into my private practice, They've been a vegan or a vegetarian for a while. 
often they're struggling with hormone health in some capacity. And so one main aspect we have to address is, okay, let's deuterium deplete your mitochondria to help you um, get your mitochondria functioning optimally because cancer is a disease of poor mitochondrial function, right? So we really need to get the engines working properly um, in order to overcome something like cancer or hormonal imbalances because uh, the mitochondria really need to be functioning optimally in order for you to recover from any disease or condition. Uh, so in my experience, if this was me approaching this question, I have a hormone positive cancer, the ketogenic diet has, you know, not done much for me. I'm not really resonating with it. I'm thinking about going to back to vegan or vegetarianism. Um, personally, if this was me, I would not revert back to a vegan diet. It would be an unwise move in, in my, if I were approaching this situation from my perspective, um, and if this were me. So uh, there's some other core elements to address here, okay? One is addressing inflammation levels and some deuterium depletion at the mitochondrial level. And uh, another one is getting some healthy animal fats and animal protein in the diet to help rebuild uh, your cholesterol levels. And I'll get into the labs a little bit that you mentioned here, and we'll talk more about cholesterol. But really, we need to get your hormones pumping out, uh, you know, more hormones. Uh, and, and that's really the key to this whole picture is to, to bring your hormones back into balance. And reverting back to a vegan or vegetarian diet would put the brakes on this uh, process. So, you know, let, let's revisit this topic of hormonal cancers and, and what causes hormonal cancers because we can Google things to death, right? And what we're going to find is animal products cause hormonal cancers. You know, maybe we'll find something on stress. Maybe we'll find something on a high fat diet. And um, these are some of the most common things we see when we Google search for, okay, what, what caused my hormone cancer? Why am I having this? You know, Night shift work can also be another one, but let's dive into why this actually happens. I have seven core reasons as to why somebody might struggle with a hormone-related cancer. So number one is a poor light environment, and I'm going to dive into these a little bit more throughout the episode as well, but number one is a poor light environment. What really, the, the dots we need to start to connect um, is this in a nutshell? When light hits your eye, it sends signals to your pituitary gland, to your anterior pituitary gland regarding hormone signaling. If you are interacting with crap light all day from a screen, a cell phone, LED lights, um, fluorescent lights. If you're just indoors, we know that windows, you know, block what? 40 to 60% of red light and no UV light is let in. So if we just think about that, living indoors predominantly much of the day, you're going to be getting mostly blue light in your home. Okay. So a poor light environment is at the root of our hormone struggles. This includes um, hormone positive breast cancers, it includes infertility, it includes menstrual struggles, it includes any hormonal imbalance. We have not fully accepted this, but it is knee deep in the scientific literature. We just have to turn our vision and attention to these studies into this area and, and learn to be open to this um, new information that's been in the literature literally for hundreds of years that we've simply learned to ignore since the um, Watson and Crick DNA model came about. And even before then, we, we've just basically really been looking in this linear fashion at how to approach cancer and other chronic diseases. And this has now come to a really big fault with our our poor uh, light 
lifestyles, literally we're indoors more and now we have the pandemic, we're told to stay inside, we're told to work from home, et cetera. This is just further perpetuating the issue. So if you have artificial light entering your eye, going into your retina, going into the RPE, um, and that's the signal, it's going to send your hormones. A lot of people have flatlined hormones, poor hor hormonal health, simply because they're interacting with the wrong type of light. This is one core driving cause of cancer. So a lot of people will look to a ketogenic diet or a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet to rectify their cancer. And while yes, we absolutely need to include a healing diet into the program, into the healing protocol, light trumps diet. So you could be eating the best diet in the world, but if you are surrounded and inundated by poor light, by artificial light, you're not, that's a block to healing. The diet isn't going to work as well. You need a, a, a healthy light environment, okay, sunlight, paired with a healthy diet to get results. Food is grown in light. If the food you're eating is not aligning with the light that you're seeing, this is a huge cause of inflammation and circadian mismatch. Literally the last three episodes of this, the podcast um, have gone into greater detail about this, uh, including carbohydrate metabolism, light, why we need to marry our light environment with the light our food was grown in to support our health. So I'd really encourage you to go back and, and check out those episodes to learn the nuts and bolts about this. But number one driving cause of any hormonal imbalance is a poor light environment because your eyes are literally um, sending compromised signals to your hormones. So um, that's that might seem like so easy. When people hear that, they're like, yeah, Heather, but but I should be eating like a really good green smoothie and superfood and, you know, chia seeds and goji berries and, you know, matcha tea and et cetera. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. I know that's exactly how we've been conditioned to think and approach health, but I'm going to stop you at the pass right there. We need to address your light environment first. Okay. Because this is what signals your hormones. Light signals your hormones, light signals your metabolism, okay? Um, so if you're living in a poor light environment, your hormones are going to diminish, okay, over time. Um, two is EMF exposure. If you're living in a high EMF environment, if you always have the Wi-Fi on in your house, if you're living by a cell tower, et cetera, this is going to compromise um, how your metabolism and hormones signal to one another. Um, it's going to cause an interference that is a block to healing. Number three, this goes along with number one, a sunlight deficiency. What the heck does this have to do with hormone health? This is the question I get. I was like, yeah, but Heather, I'm trying to rebuild my hormones. I know, yeah, sunlight's great and I need to go out and I just love how I feel in sunlight, but I'm trying to rebuild my hormones. Exactly. How do you make your hormones? You need 312 nanometer light plus LDL cholesterol to make vitamin D. Vitamin D, actually, that's, that's an inaccurate um, description uh, or definition of what that molecule actually is. Vitamin D is a hormone, okay? It's why we see really low vitamin D levels in cancer, unless you're you know, taking a supplement then you'll have you know, pseudo levels of vitamin D. You need 312 nanometer light plus LDL cholesterol to make steroid hormones, to make vitamin D, okay? So what's 312 nanometer light? That's UV light. It's a light we're told to avoid. It's the light we're told, to ca we're told causes cancer. It's the light that you make vitamin D in. A sunlight deficiency leads to hormonal imbalances and hormonal disorders and things like uh, hormone positive breast cancer because your hormones don't have the fuel and the signals they need to actually produce healthy 
levels of vitamin D and steroid hormones. Number four, vegan and vegetarian diets. These can actually increase susceptibility to hormonal disorders, hormone positive cancers, because they're lacking um, that cholesterol. You can only get cholesterol from animal foods. Only animals make cholesterol. Plants don't make cholesterol. So um, when you're on a long-term vegan uh, and or vegetarian diet, you're not getting, while you can make, you can make cholesterol on your own. Um, however, today, with the environments that we live in and the EMFs and the light we're inundated with, we need more cholesterol in our diet um, in order to protect and support our hormones. Cholesterol has so many vital roles in the body. It's not the bad guy that we've been told it is, and, and it doesn't contribute to heart disease. It doesn't contribute to clogged arteries. This is a complete misconception. We need it in the diet in order to support our hormone health, our nervous system, our detox pathways. It's a, an antioxidant, so we really need it in the diet. Long-term vegan and vegetarian diets um, can increase susceptibility to hormone disorders and hormone-related cancers because they don't have cholesterol in it, which we need to make hormones. Number five. Hormonal cancers are also caused by high levels of deuterium. This can be in your water. This could be in the type of foods you're eating. And then we, I should also add to that the inability to deplete deuterium from your mitochondria. Again, last episode goes into full detail about deuterium. What is it? You can learn more about it if this is your first time hearing about this, but it's super, super, super inflammatory to the mitochondria. Okay, we do need it in some parts of our body like the plasma, but we do not want it in the mitochondria. This um, really drives up inflammation levels and contributes to all chronic disease today. Um, so that is a major cause of hormonal related cancers. Number six, you know, if you've been on birth control, if you've been on a hormone release IUD, if you've taken synthetic hormones, if you've had a hysterectomy, um, if you, this is what I often see, women who have a child and then a year or so out get a get breast cancer. There's a lot of layers here, but the, the synthetic hormones and the, and the birth control, the IUDs, the synthetic hormones, et cetera, this is, um, these need to be detoxed from the body. Um, and then, it, you know, for, for somebody who already has deficient hormones, they go into, they get pregnant um, and then they have the baby. And this really can flatline hormones if you don't have your hormones in check uh, before and throughout the pregnancy. So um, this often can be uh, a driving cause behind hormone related cancers because there's simply not enough hormones in there um, to allow for health and healing. And um, this can, can cause hormone related cancers. And number seven is a poor diet. Um, so if, and, and by poor diet, I'm talking about processed and packaged foods, you know, um, a lot of high carbs, just you know, eating box things, microwave foods, these sort of things can all contribute to hormone related cancers and hormonal imbalances. So the big question is how do we rebuild hormone health and uh, adequate hormone signaling? The answer is not a strict keto diet. And the, the listener who asked the question, you know, basically told us this answer. She's been on a strict ketogenic diet. Her labs got worse and um, she's not seeing the improvements that she's seeking, that she desires, that she wants to have. A strict ketogenic diet, in my experience on uh, working with people and my own personal experience, it's not going to rectify or improve poor hormone health and poor hormone signaling. So how can you do this? Basically, it's just, you know, what we previously talked about here is one, you need to do your sunlight RX. And I'm talking about not just going out in the sun for 15 minutes a day, like 
um, the standard recommendation is, that's, that's not gonna do anything, okay? We need to get our sunlight exposure up into the hours range, okay? And I know when I say that, people are like, well, but I can't get out for that long, or um, my job doesn't allow me to, or, uh, you know, a lot, that, that's a real struggle for most people. When I first started to learn about sunlight, the healing, the therapeutic principles of sunlight, I was like, okay, uh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to see what the impact is. I'm going to see how it affects my body. I'm going to see how I feel. I did it for a month, started to feel a lot better. I was like, hmm, could this really be from sunlight? It can't be. Just sunlight, like literally, I poured thousands of dollars into different therapies and supplements and diets and et cetera. And now I'm in basically this something that's free to everyone on earth and I'm feeling better. And I'm talking about when was I in sunlight? I was in sunlight at sunrise. I was, I ate my breakfast in sunlight and was out there till 10 a.m. You know, then I would schedule my work from about 11 to 12, 12 30. And then I would go back out from one to two, uh, one to two thirty, and you know, pump out my vitamin D. Come back in, do a couple hours of work, eat dinner outside. See, I so I was spending hours a day in the sun, and I had dramatic results that have been long lasting. Um, so we put a lot of our emphasis in diet. Whereas really the hormones and the metabolic and the signaling and the integrity of those systems are highly dependent and driven by the type of light you interact with. So if you haven't learned the Sunlight RX yet, you can go to my site, heathershepherd.com, and just scroll down the homepage. You'll see a, a, an area where you can purchase a Sunlight RX ebook. It literally lays out in four steps. How do you use sunlight to um, improve me metabolic health, hormone health, overall health, et cetera? So number one, um, when it comes to rebuilding your hormones, more sunlight to improve hormone signaling, okay? Um, to improve uh, all the hormones that we know are deficient in cancer, melatonin, vitamin D, right? We need to restore those things. And we can do so. Nature designed us 3.5 billion years ago to do so in sunlight. Number two, we need to decrease inflammation levels, right? Going back to that deuterium depletion at the mitochondrial level. We need to change the light that you look at that hits your skin and that hits your eyes. So um, when you all may have heard of melanin, okay? This is a really uh, important molecule when it comes to hormone health, metabolic health, it interacts with light and sends these messages to your hormones and to your met metabolism regarding how to fire, when to fire, when to release certain hormones, and melanin's located in your eye and it's located in your skin. So not only do we have to protect the type of light that our eyes interact with, but we have to protect the kind of light our skin interacts with. Um, because this is going to regulate the hormone and metabolic signaling in our body. So, for example, if you're doing some work on your computer and you're in your sports bra or you're nude or you're, you know, wearing a tiny shirt or, you know, you're just wrapped in a towel, you know, we need to protect our skin because that's going to have a big impact on how our hormones and metabolism are signaling. And number four, we need to get engaged in a metabolic reset diet, literally a diet that's aligned with uh, your light environment, sunlight, okay? The sunlight that's available in your area, we need to uh, marry that with a metabolic reset diet. In my experience with myself and working with people over the past 12 years, a ketogenic diet cannot reset the metabolism, okay? So um, that is a little bit about rebuilding the hormones in a nutshell. And I want to mention here that individuals who have been long-term vegan or vegetarian and then they um, have 
an epiphany to switch to a ketogenic diet or add more fat and animal products into their diet, um, your body has gone so long without eating those foods and then suddenly eating, say, a lot of animal fat that's uh, promoted on a ketogenic diet. Literally, your gallbladder has learned over time to produce less and less and less and less bile. Bile is absolutely necessary to the digestive process, to the detoxification process. It is crucial to the immune system process, okay? So if you've been a long-term vegan or vegetarian and you start eating a lot of fat, you, don't, you literally don't have enough bile to break that fat down. Okay, so this could be one of the driving forces behind why your triglycerides went up. Now, I need to caution that if your triglycerides go up, it actually isn't always a bad thing. We've been taught that that's bad, but there's different forms of triglycerides that are some of them are actually positive and supportive to health. So it's hard to say which ones went up in the in the listener who who uh, submitted the question. Um, without looking at different triglyceride levels, but it's not always bad. Um, but if you've been vegan or vegetarian and you start eating a lot of fat, and you're like, oh, I feel horrible. Like I need to go back vegan. Well, let's hold the phone. You literally probably don't have enough bile to break down those fats. Um, you, you know, and, and without that bile, you can't digest the fats. You can't assimilate the fats. So we can't throw people into a ketogenic diet who've been vegan or vegetarian because they're literally going to, um, they're not going to be able to as- absorb or assimilate all the fats that they're eating. So that's another red flag that I have around this process. A lot of people struggle with finding the right diet and meal plan to support not only their health, but their taste buds as well. As a nutritionist with over 12 years experience, I want to help you answer your deep burning questions around food, diet, meal prep, special diets, and how to swap unhealthy ingredients for healthier ingredients. And I'm opening the doors for you all to ask your questions around this very topic. And these questions will be answered right here on the Primal Pioneer podcast. All you have to do is submit your question to me and I'll answer it during the show. Here's how you can submit your burning nutrition, food, and diet questions. First, on your phone, go into your voice memo app and record your name, location, and question. Feel free to share anything about your health experiences, cooking failures or successes, and personal experience with food and nutrition if you'd like. You can also choose to keep yourself anonymous. Then upload the file to me at Keto Cancer Solution, that's K-E-T-O, Cancer Solution at gmail.com. I'll play your question on the show and we'll answer it in full detail to help support your dietary food adventures and healing process. Now let's head back to the episode to learn more about metabolism, resetting your metabolism and improving hormonal health. Let's take a look at the labs because I know if you're someone out there with cancer, if you're someone out there who often has your um, labs drawn, let's take a look at some of these things because um, typically if you go into a medical professional, they give you your lab results and, you know, like this individual who submitted the question, you know, protein was low, albumin low, white blood count low, all lower after the keto diet, right? So. Um, usually they'll give you a very linear materialistic response as to, oh, eat more protein or you have an infection because your white blood cell count is low. Let's take a look at some of the deeper layers here. This is a surface approach that most people are given. And we're going to dive deep into this because uh, it's really important to look at your labs from the lens of uh, a mitochondrial perspective. Uh, pretty much every lab will be a reflection in some way as to either and or how your hormones are um, functioning, how your metabolism is functioning, and what kind of light environment you are exposed to. So I completely understand that after you have committed your healing process, your life to, 
doing something that you think is really good and supportive to your health. Like this individual went from vegan vegetarianism to keto because they got a cancer diagnosis. They didn't resonate with, with the um, vegetarian way. And so they tried keto. Okay. And so when they got their blood test results, it's like, uh, whoa, what's going on? Things are looking worse. Okay. So first of all, before we go there, if you're feeling better in your body, despite what the labs are saying, we always want to take that into consideration and to look at that. So my first question would be to anybody who, you know, saw their lab values go down is how are you actually feeling in your body? Um, I had a, a client come by the other day and um, they were like, you know, this is also an individual with struggling with, with breast cancer at the time. And they were like, you know, I, I've tried vegan and then I went, I went to a ketogenic diet and I'm doing this hardcore ketogenic diet. I don't know how to get all the fat in because I feel horrible when I eat all this fat. And I said, I'm going to stop you right there because they were, they were asking me if I thought the ketogenic diet was the best thing for them. I said, I'm just going to ask you one thing. How do you feel when you eat the ketogenic diet? I feel horrible. Okay. That's an indication that something's off because when you engage in a diet or any healing modality, you at least want to see some signs of improvement. If you're not feeling better, if you're feeling worse, if you are not feeling good on the diet, that's a red flag. So we just need to continue to dissolve the myth that diet is the you know key solution to any condition including cancer honestly and i think you'll you'll begin to see this more clearly as i dive into the labs that the light environment is the most important okay this is the most instead of thinking of a food diet we need to think of our healing in terms of a light diet how can i improve my light environment and then take the steps to commit to improving your light environment. Okay. Um, I know, as I mentioned, not everyone would be like, uh, I can't just like quit my job and go outside for five hours a day. Heather, I can't just do that. I totally get that. I completely understand. But there are some steps that you can take that all of us can take to start to improve our light environment starting, you know, immediately. So, and then taking baby steps to, okay, continuing to improve the light environment because when we understand and connect the dots, how important light is to our health and healing process, we'll dive into it as deep and hardcore as we would any type of diet that's out there. Um, and let's explore these labs a little bit because I think it'll, it'll start to connect the dots between the light environment and the great importance there. So her albumin went down right? This makes no sense from a linear perspective. You know, she's eating more animal products, you know, what's going on? Um, why did albumin go down? It should have gone up. Well, first of all, I sense that this individual actually isn't getting enough um, healthy animal protein or just animal protein in general. Um, but also we need to look at albumin, like what actually is it? Albumin is a fluorophore protein. What does that mean in simple terms that it needs UV light to function? Any fluorophore protein needs to interact with UV light in order to function. Fluorophore protein is code for <laughs> needs UV light to function. <laughs> so Albumin is a fluorophore protein in the blood. It needs UV light. Albumin has 4.66% tyrosine. Okay, this is an aromatic amino acid. And it has 0.19% tryptophan, another amino acid. You'll hear those percentages and you're like, Heather, that is so low, who cares? It's a big deal because those two aromatic amino acids need to interact and be activated by UV light. And when they're not, the blood, uh, the components of the plasma will significantly uh, be impacted. So tryptophan, by the way, is the precursor to melatonin. So everybody thinks of melatonin as the nighttime hormone. However, you need UV light um, 
in order to activate tryptophan in order to then recycle your melatonin. So while melatonin is released from the pineal gland three to four hours after dark, you replenish your stores in UV light. How many people with cancer are deficient in melatonin? And so they're told to take a melatonin supplement every single cancer patient that I know. This is not getting to the root of the issue. If we want to improve melatonin stores, we need to learn how to recycle melatonin in UV light. I outlined this on the Sunlight RX, but this is really important for the albumin levels and why they're struggling, why, they, why they've gone down. Because diet actually doesn't really impact these levels as much as we're taught to think. What has a greater impact on our lab values is the type of light you're interacting with. Just like this individual is eating an amazing therapeutic ketogenic diet, the books are telling her, this is it. This is what you need to eat. This is how you, you know, starve cancer and heal. However, we need to dive deeper. That's an antiquated approach that we're using when it comes to cancer. We need to add in light because a lot of the molecules and proteins in our body need light to be activated and to function and to signal. Albumin is one of those, okay? So tyrosine and tryptophan, two aromatic amino acids, they need to be activated by UV light in order to work. Step two of the Sunlight RX teaches you how to activate these aromatic amino acids. All aromatic amino acids have a benzene ring around that. That is code for it is a UV light trap. Okay, it traps UV light and then activates tryptophan, tyrosine, and all other aromatic amino acids are activated in the presence of UV light. So for anybody out there struggling with, and I'm going to mention this because if the individual who asked this question struggles with, you know, low dopamine levels, so that could look like constipation, it could look like, um, you know, a depressed mood, literally depression, mood imbalances. Um, if you struggle with serotonin levels, literally you need serotonin again for that upbeat mood to feel good, to feel happy, to feel positive about life. Also dopamine and serotonin, they, they are huge keys in your bowel movements. So they literally move the stool down the track and they're what performs that peristaltic activity. You don't get enough UV light, you're not gonna have that adequate uh, peristaltic activity um, driven by dopamine and serotonin and a little bit by melatonin to have healthy bowel movements. What else does UV light do? Um, you need it for T3 production, thyroid hormone. This is actually, um, I, I want to insert this here because I'm not sure what the individual's thyroid panel looks like. Sometimes, you know, thyroid panels, um, you know, pulled in labs, they aren't always accurate. Um, they're not an, always an accurate indicator of what the thyroid status actually is. We really need to go on um, some other symptoms to see how thyroid health is. So some things I like to look at is what's the quality of the hair because thinning of the hair can point to depressed thyroid. Anyone who's um, missing like the, the beginning part of their eyebrows that's, um, or, or just like the hair loss, you're starting to lose hair at the beginning part of your eyebrows. That's a sign of a thyroid imbalance, uh, sluggish digestion. And these are more so on the, on the hypo Hashimoto side, sluggish digestion, poor, uh, energy levels, poor hormone panel are all signs that your thyroid function is compromised. And literally T3, right? is drive T3 and T4 are derived from the aromatic amino acid tyrosine. So this needs to be activated in UV light in order to support thyroid health. Now, lastly, UV light is also needed uh, to perform sulfation processes in our body. Now, I'm going to get more into this in just a minute here, but there's a lot of molecules and proteins in your body that need to be sulfated in order for you to be healthy. Your red blood cells, your white blood cells, vitamin D, cholesterol, etc. they need to be sulfated. 
It's my guess that there's some sulfation issues going on with the individual who asked the question. There's a UV light deficiency going on. When the albumin is low, it tells me that the light environment isn't adequate, um, meaning there's not enough UV light in um, the individual's life to literally um, improve the albumin levels once that UV light interacts with tyrosine, tryptophan, and the aromatic amino acids in the blood. So um, if you are someone out there and you have low albumin levels, this can cause anything from water retention to a high BUN to creatine ratio. That's one ratio I look at to see how much water the mitochondria are actually producing. And if that water production is compromised in any way, um, you want that ratio to be seven, about seven to one, 10 to one at the highest. Also, when the, the albumin levels are low, this can be a sign that your cells aren't making enough water and that the electrical charge around the cell um, isn't adequate. And so that needs to be recharged. If we think about your body as a battery, okay, because let's just think about your cell phone as a battery. What do we do? We plug it in, we plug the charger into the cell phone, we plug it into the electrical socket, right? How do we recharge as humans? Because we run on electrical currents also. We recharge in sunlight, okay? That's literally the power source. We recharge when we're grounding in nature, okay? Those electrons coming up through the earth. And you know how else we recharge is um, after you've gone swimming in the ocean, maybe you've dipped into a creek or a river and you lay in sunlight, that is like an optimal way to recharge your battery, okay? So those are the three main ways to do so. If you have a low albumin level, um, that those things are well worth looking into, um, especially if you struggle with fatigue, poor sleep, leg cramps, a chronic condition, you know, that's, that's a red flag that you need to recharge your battery. Some of you out there might have a high albumin level. If albumin levels are high, this is typically a sign that the liver's in pretty good shape um, and you just simply need sunlight to start to activate uh, the molecules, the proteins that are needed to bring uh, the albumin levels into a healthy range. Low albumin levels, the liver might be slightly compromised. And we can see this with the individual who asked the question that, um, you know, the HDL went down, right? Anytime HDL goes down, this is tell me something, the, the liver isn't quite defending itself um, adequately. And HDL is a reflection as to the defense mechanism of the liver. It's also a reflection of what's going on in the gut microbiome. So as HDL levels go down, this typically can reflect there's uh, some a high pathogen load in the gut that's assaulting the liver, and that alone right there can can compromise thyroid production, hormone production, etc. Um, so that that's just something to consider. Again, uh, this is why DNA GI map stool testing is a big part of my practice as well because we can get a, an, a close eye, a close look at what's going on in the gut, what's going on in the stool, what's going on in the gut microbiome. Are there a lot of pathogens? Is there a lot of inflammation? And this can give a good idea as to, okay, if your gut is overloaded with pathogens, which pathogens are they? And um, at what level are they, they you know, functioning at in your gut? And so then you can make a proactive plan as to how to target specific pathogens and start to remove them from the body. Um, there's a lot we can go into about tyrosine, its impact um, on the albumin, on the blood, on the mitochondria. Uh, there's a lot of connections between CoQ enzyme um, 10 and uh, its ability to help improve mitochondrial function that all tie back into the light environment. Uh, so that is a look at um, the albumin lab, a little bit about the lower HDL lab. Let's take a look at the white blood cells because a lot of people struggle with this. They have a low white blood cell count, right? 
And so what we're taught is this is a red flag that there's an infection in the body. This could be, totally could be. Okay, I don't want to like discredit that at all because there could be. We want to explore that more. Is it a chronic low-grade infection? Is it an acute infection? Okay, we want to explore that more. But also we want to dive below the surface here because in especially in um, white blood cell counts that uh, are low and continue to go low, lower over time, we need to really look at some of the root causes here. So this ties back into what I mentioned previously about sulfation. There are certain things in your body that rely on a process called sulfation for your body to work literally like a well-oiled machine, okay? So what are some examples of things that need to be sulfated in your body in order to work? Well, your cholesterol needs to be sulfated, right? Cholesterol sulfate. Your vitamin D needs to be sulfated, vitamin D sulfate. This is why I'm not a huge fan of just vitamin D supplementation, especially without the Sunlight RX, because it's not sulfated. Your vitamin D in a, in a pill, in a liquid form, in the bottle, it's not sulfated. And, and sulfated vitamin D acts very differently than synthetic vitamin D in a pill form. So your cholesterol needs to be sulfated. Your vitamin D needs to be sulfated. Your blood platelets need to be sulfated. Your microbiome needs to be sulfated. Huge issue with anyone with leaky gut, gut autoimmunity. If their, their microbiome isn't sulfated, we're gonna bump up against some of those more chronic gut issues. Then your white blood cells need to be sulfated. Literally, your white blood cells are sulfated by H2S in the microbiome. So... There's a lot of things in the body. Those are just a few of the core elements that need to be sulfated in order to work properly in the body. If your vitamin D isn't sulfated, you can't make steroid hormones effectively. This is why so many people say, oh, take melatonin, take vitamin D um, in pill form. Hang on, they're not sulfated. In order for those to work in the body, um, in, in a positive physiological way, they literally need to be sulfated. So what's the big deal here? Like why, why do things need to be sulfated? Um, here's why. If you can't sulfate, you cannot have these five core things. Okay. Uh, number one, healthy hormones. Okay. This the hormones are made from cholesterol. Okay. Vitamin D is a hormone you need cholesterol to be sulfated in order to make healthy hormones. Vitamin D, it doesn't work properly if it's not sulfated. Your red, red blood cells need to be sulfated. You're, you'll bump up against issues with platelets, with anemia, with clotting, with B12 levels. I've literally seen people with low vitamin B12 levels simply from living in a poor light environment, which drives poor sulfation. These are things to look at at deeper layers when it comes to, hey, if you have anemia and you've been struggling with that forever, we need to start looking at your ability to sulfate molecules and proteins. Um, number four, you're going to have a compromised gut microbiome. And number five, that all ultimately leads to compromised white blood cell count. So how? How can you improve sulfation capabilities? You're never going to guess. This is going to be, you know, way out there. Never heard of this before. Number one, sunlight. Okay. Sulfur plus phosphorus equals sulfation. Okay. And you need sunlight um, to sulfate molecules in your blood. Think about this. Maybe you've had this experience. When sunlight hits your skin, your blood vessels literally raise to the surface. So sometimes we can even see our blood vessels getting bigger in the presence of sunlight, right? Or if we exercise outside. So when sun hits your skin, the blood vessels rise to the surface. Why? So they can absorb more light. The more light that your blood absorbs, the better sulfation processes will be, okay? And this is really huge. Literally, if you just get in more sunlight, you're going to improve your sulfation pathways. Why do things need to be sulfated? So you can make your hormones, so you can detox properly, 
so you can hit that methionine cycle, you know, in a healthy way. A lot of people, I'm going to throw this out there because uh, of the nature of the question uh, that's related to cancer and a cancer diagnosis. Many people who get cancer, they'll go through all this testing, okay? They'll, they'll, they'll want their genes tested. Do they have the BRCA? You know, what, what genes are at play here? Often the MTHFR gene comes up and other, you know, SNPs that, um, SNPs that reflect poor detoxification capabilities. And so what's the response there? Okay. Because so many people have done this genetic testing and then what, and then what is, what's the protocol? How do we, how do we heal that? Well, um, a lot of people like you can literally, you know, send in a hair sample or prick your finger and, and send in genetic testing. There's other ways to do it. Some like naturopaths, functional medicine doctors, they'll they'll send in, you know, samples to the lab and then they'll they'll show you your genetic test results. And this is the SMPs that came up and these are the red flags for you. And so the common response is there'll be like a list of foods that you should avoid um, that your body simply can't detox or process because of the SMPs or the SNPs that presented, right? Total Band-Aid solution. We're not really getting to the root of the issue. The root of the issue is that you cannot sulfate your proteins. They're not being sulfated. When things aren't sulfated, you can't detox. So yes, of course, something like an MTHFR is going to show up. So of course, you're going to have trouble detoxing chemo or radiation or heavy metals or any environmental toxin. So this is why the sulfation process is so important. And in order to do that, we need to get your eyes, your skin, your gut in the Sunlight RX throughout the day. Let's talk about diet because this was a core question that the, um, the listener who submitted the question wanted some insight around. I've been talking a little bit about this throughout the episode, but um, first and foremost, we know that this um, individual responded not super well to a ketogenic diet. And with their history of veganism and vegetarianism, they likely don't have enough bile stores to even assimilate, absorb, process that high fat diet that the, the ketogenic diet principles are based on, right? If this were me, I would really consider a metabolic reset diet. What the heck is that? This is something that I actually had to learn. I guess you'd say the hard way of being on a ketogenic diet for literally years and having some, you could say, negative impacts, okay? Weight gain, poor sleep, um, hormones just just shot. Hormones were, were literally shot. Um, and I was so tired and anxious. And I was like, you know, it took me far too long to realize, hey, why am I on this diet? It's actually not really serving me. You know why it was though? Because everything I read was like keto, keto for this, keto for that, keto does this, cauliflower for this, cauliflower rice, cauliflower pizza you know, all those keto foods. It's like, okay, but how am I feeling in my body? I wasn't feeling great. And the results, the reflection wasn't great either. So I began to think and research, this actually isn't helping my metabolism or my hormones. How can I engage in a diet that will do so? Before you go there and, and throw all your eggs into one basket, in order to reset your hormones and metabolism, you need to incorporate sunlight with diet and you need to incorporate um, artificial light mitigation with sunlight and diet as well, okay? Metabolic reset, um, this is something that I found to include, you know, therapeutic ketogenic um, uh, principles, you know, shades of those. Um, but it's not solely a ketogenic diet. Um, I found most of the women I work with and myself also did not super great on a full-blown ketogenic diet. Okay, so I focused more on a metabolic reset. And this was the key 
for helping not only myself, but the clients I work with to help reset their metabolism. Because let's be real, any cancer, any metabolic disorder, yes, of course, at the core, the mitochondria are not functioning optimally. The metabolism is struggling. The hormones are struggling, right? So we need to reset the metabolism. And this has, how do you reset metabolism? Think about your bowel movements and how, um, you know, the goal is to, to have a, a bowel movement right around the same time every day, preferably in the morning. That cycle, um, your bowel movement patterns is set by uh, something called your circadian biology or the circadian rhythm. So literally the natural rhythms, your, your biological time clock regulates when you have a bowel movement, right? Remember dopamine, serotonin, pushing the, the, the stool down the track, regulated by light, UV light, right? So um, when it comes to our metabolism, um, we need a diet that also will help to reset our circadian biology. A ketogenic diet, think about the nature of that diet. When would somebody, you know, our ancient ancestors eat that diet? in the wintertime. It's a wintertime diet, right? Carbs aren't available. Fruits aren't available. What's available? Fat and animal protein. Even though the ketogenic diet is wicked low in animal protein, um, you know, it's still, that's kind of like the diet of winter times, the diet we would eat in a wintertime environment. You know, our ancient ancestors ate that type of diet. If we're wanting to get to the core of cancer, resetting the metabolism, we need to actually take in some consideration here as to the season you're in, the light environment you're in. To truly reset the circadian biology, we need to get your biological time clock aligned with sunlight. We can do this through the Sunlight RX, and we can do this simultaneously through the light environment your food was grown in. The metabolic reset diet that I have formulated takes these things into, into deep consideration. They're the hub, they're the core of the diet, as well as meal timing. So a lot of people, and I did an episode all about this, uh, the, the Bulletproof Coffee episode, a lot of people will, will, especially if they have cancer, have heard intermittent fast, fast, um, you know, skip breakfast, bulletproof through breakfast, go as long as you can without eating. Whoa huge, huge red flag for anybody with a hormonal imbalance or a metabolic disorder. In order to get the metabolism and hormone signaling in sync, we need to jumpstart that with a meal in the beginning of the day and not a bulletproof coffee that will artificially inflate cortisol levels and further deplete the hormones, right? Um, so we need to structure our meal timing in uh, a, a way that supports the metabolism and the metabolic reset. Also, one way to do this is there needs to be more protein than is promoted on a ketogenic diet. And when I say this, um, a lot of people are like, whoa, 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 that's going to you know, spike insulin and it's going to feed cancer. No, it, it won't. When you do it, in a way that utilizes the correct form of protein. And when you marry your light environment in your food with a light environment outside, there's also on, on the metabolic reset diet, there's less fat and there's a big, huge sunlight increase. Okay. So, you know, let's just take the ketogenic fat, you know, recommendation and Instead, remove fat recommendation and insert sunlight. And if you do that one thing, if you listen to this podcast, you listen to this episode and you're like, mm, I think she's full of shit. You know, I think this, this person, I, I, I don't believe it. Literally do that one thing in strong sunlight, okay? You can't do this in winter. You know, the people I, that I work with who are my clients, I teach them how to really build up their stores their hormones in a healthy way, their metabolism in summertime. So when winter comes, it's not like, you know, you fall off the wagon, things get worse. Some of my clients who are in, in poor shape 
I will highly encourage them to go to a sunny area like the tropics during winter months if they live at a high latitude um, to help keep the ball rolling with their healing process. But literally, try it. Like, what, what, do you, what do you have to lose, really? Like, just download the Sunlight Rx ebook, try it, you know, spend a minimum of four to five hours out in, in sunlight, and let me know how that goes for you. I, I think you'll be really surprised. I was, sh- I was floored when I started this. You know, like I mentioned, I was in sunlight, you know, the first month I was like, no this, this can't, this can't be right. Like this, this cannot be, I can't be feeling better from sunlight month two, even better, meaning more energy, better sleep, better digestion, gut microbiome improved, which is by the way, most of the bacteria in your gut microbiome uh, are influenced by sunlight and what kind of climate you live in. So you'll have a different like gut microbiome Uh, a collection of different bugs, beneficial bugs, depending on you live in the, if you live in the desert or if you live in a tropical region or if you live in a more humid region. And really, again, we're not, I won't get into this in detail here in this episode, but the gut microbiome is very, very intimately linked to the light environment and to the, the climate that you're in, humidity, dryness, et cetera. You will see fluctuations in your bowel health and your bowel patterns depending on what environment you are in. My suggestion when it comes to diet is focus on more of a metabolic reset and this includes meal timing without skipping breakfast, no bulletproof, sunlight, there's more protein, there's less fat, um, never skip breakfast, the protein that you eat, make sure it's really high quality animal protein, this will be really huge. For for any of you who follow me on, on social media, on Instagram or, or Facebook, you'll likely see my food pictures. I post a lot of food pictures because cooking is something I'm super passionate about. I love it. If um, if I don't, you know, cook every day, it's kind of like the people who, who are really love running or uh, something like that and they don't do it for a day and they're in a bad mood. It's like, I need to cook every day. I also need to hike every day, but I need to cook every day. Um, and and so you likely have seen pictures of like shrimp and fish and salmon and haddock and you know you're like whoa this where's all this seafood coming from seafood is a core element in my diet and it's a core element that i recommend in uh the metabolic reset diet because it's so rich in dha and dha you know is also found in vegan and vegetarian foods but there's a big difference in that the, the dha found in in fish in animal foods um you know shellfish uh, wild caught seafood enters uh liver detox pathways and the central nervous system whereas that does not occur in vegetarian sources of uh dha so uh, i wanted to kind of insert that because i know the the woman who asked the question here was really you know pondering going back to a vegan diet so i wanted to drop that in there little overview here hormone production starts in the skin and the eye cancer really uh, what is the definition if we were to define cancer if we were to you know let go of the anti antiquated definition we've had around it uh you know sugar feeds cancer any anything feeds cancer the the thing is we need to shift and improve how your metabolism uh your metabolic pathways and your hormones are signaling and we need to improve your sulfation okay and so that is how we get to some core issues when it comes to cancer so really cancer can be summed up as a diminished um poor light environment that's causing diminished signaling at the eye level and at the skin level. And this cannot be healed or corrected with diet alone, right? Oh, one other thing I wanted to pop in here, it just came into my head about the white blood cell thing. White blood cell count is highly affected by flicker. So the flicker effect of light, 
So things like Facebook has literally programmed in a certain flicker rate to keep people scrolling for longer periods of time. So they put these flicker rates into, you know, Facebook, into their platform in order to keep people on there. Because if you get people with certain flicker rates, you can catch their attention, you can hold their attention and keep them there. You know, um, it, it's basically a form of mind control. Facebook's doing some pretty awesome things these days, you know, <laughs> with with their censorship and, and flicker rates. So um, Facebook isn't the only one with flicker. You know, you, you, you know how you feel after um, you look at a light that's been like flashing, like a strobe light. It's like, whoa, you feel like weird, maybe a little dizzy, maybe a little vertigo. That's like, you can really tell there's flicker in those kind of lights, right? But the flicker is so subtle um, in, in, like Facebook and other platforms that you can't even, you can't even tell, you can't even see the effect. Right. But this is something that'll impact white blood cell count as well. Um, so I know we didn't get to deep dive here into the mental emotional aspects, which are really, really important. Uh, maybe I can do a follow-up episode in the future about this, but I'll just uh, uh, pop in a few lines here about that is that there are aspects of health that our conventional medical model and even much of the alternative medical model doesn't shine its light on very brightly, if at all, at this time. And that is the mental and the emotional aspects of healing. It's why I love and um, utilize homeopathy in my life and my practice because this helps to start to get to some of the deeper buried emotional aspects that contribute to disease. Uh, even events that happened and especially events that happened early in life. Okay. Um, hardships, you know, divorces, traumas, um, losses, deaths of someone we loved, um, a relationship gone sour, um, an affair, et cetera. All of these things create an emotional storm, right? And what we do with that emotional storm, the tools were offered at the time that happens, um, or the tools were not offered is, is more likely how it goes, especially early in life, it has a big determining factor on the diseases and disorders you are susceptible to throughout your life. And so, really, um, when it comes to cancer, there's no one diet fits all. Okay. There, there's, there's no one size fits all solution to, to anything. The topics that I discussed here today about sunlight, about sulfation, about metabolic reset. Yeah. These are some of the things that are going to help the physical body get back into a healthier, more balanced place. But to truly keep that physical, uh, the physical health rooted in that healthy place, we must address the emotional uh, and mental issues uh, that date back as far as, you know, from birth all the way up until present day. Um, and, and so that is a really huge thing to address because those emotional traumas, wounds, experiences, they create a ripple effect. They create um, an energy in your body. And um, that energy that they're created, let's say there was a big grief, right? Let's say, um, let's say you lost your, your grandma at a, you were 14 and, and she was, you know, older, you know, you lost your grandma at that age and you didn't fully grieve it. You were really close to her she meant a lot to you. And then over time, you started to develop like abandonment issues or fear of being alone. Um, and, and then over time, those weren't addressed. And uh, then you start developing anxieties throughout your life. These are so subtle. We would never, you know, trace these back to uh, how we felt when our grandma died at 14, for example. So these are other layers that um, I, ha I didn't get time to dive into in, in the extent that I wanted to during this episode, but um, we'll have to add that into, the, into future episodes for you all um, because that is, if those aspects aren't cleared up, 
you can do the physical healing thing until the cows come home and still bump up against blocks to healing. So this episode was, was more so, you know, focused on the physical, but I just want to mention that the emotional and mental are just as important, if not more important to clear up because usually and in, in often, if you can approach the mental and the emotional issues um, in an effective way, then that alone typically clears up the physical symptoms. So um, I really appreciate the, the question today. Thanks so much for your courage to ask that. I hope that everyone benefited um, from the question. And uh, I'll look forward to hearing more of your questions in the near future and deep diving into them, just as we did during this episode today. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning into the show today. I know this episode painted a much different picture around cancer and a keto diet than the mainstream and even keto and paleo promoters have offered. However, if we look to nature for the answers, she never fails. Aligning your light environment with the light environment your food is grown in and by getting your Sunlight RX on, these are core ways to improve metabolic and hormone health that help get to the root of cancer and other disorders that are notorious for pointing the finger at carbs and sugar versus light as their main cause. Our approach to cancer, metabolic and hormone health is significantly outdated. The approach is honestly much simpler than we've been led to believe. It's all about getting back to nature. If you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate if you could take one minute to rate and review. Each review helps more and more people just like you learn the deeper truths about our health, dietary trends, and approach to healing, and unveils the deeper truths behind what is actually driving our epidemic rates of poor health today. Don't forget to take a screenshot of this episode, share it on your Instagram stories, and tag me at sunlight underscore rx. Thanks again for tuning in, and see you next week. The Primal Pioneer podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease in the Western medical sense or terms. It is to be used for educational and informational purposes only. The information shared on this podcast and all of Heather Shepard's work is not a form of diagnostic medicine, nor is it a medical treatment. Heather Shepard is a health educator, radical health practitioner, and a trained EMF specialist. And although she has a bachelor's in science and master's education in alternative medicine, she is not a medical doctor and does not give medical advice. Her work and sharing is to be used for informational and educational purposes only. 